Hi, I am Ajit Virkud, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology from Mumbai. Hello, citizens of the internet. Today, I am going to discuss uterine fibroids. Fibroids are also called leomyoma, myoma or fibromyoma. Hippocrates called them sclerometa. Furkov named them leomyomas. In today's discussion, I am going to refer to them as fibroids. Fibroids are benign, smooth muscle, monoclonal neoplasms of the uterus arising in the myometrium and sometimes in the ligaments attached. Majority that is greater than 99% of fibroids arise in the uterus. Only about 0.4% of fibroids develop in the cervix. Very rarely, they may arise from the round ligaments, ovaries, fallopian tubes, broad ligament, vagina or vulva. First, I am going to discuss at length about the nomenclature of fibroids because there is something new. This diagram illustrates different types of fibroids. Based on their location and direction of growth, uterine fibroids are named as follows. Fibroids that grow and lie under the uterine serosa are called subserous fibroids. Fibroids which are situated entirely within the myometrium are referred to as intramural fibroids. And fibroids that grow and continue to lie under the endometrium are called submucous fibroid polyps. Subserous and submucous fibroids are further classified as sessile or pedunculate. This is a pedunculated subserous fibroid. A submucous fibroid that is attached to the endometrium by a pedicle is called as a pedunculated submucous fibroid or a fibroid polyp. A fibroid that lies between the two leaves of the broad ligament is called a broad ligament fibroid. Broad ligament or intraligamentary fibroid is called as true broad ligament fibroid if it arises from the smooth muscles in the broad ligament. It will have no connection to the myometrium. Intramural fibroid that grows laterally into the two leaves of the broad ligament is referred to as a false broad ligament fibroid. On this section, it will be seen to be attached and arising from the myometrium. This is a pedunculated fibroid arising from the cervical canal. A fibroid arising in the cervix is called a cervical fibroid. It can grow in the anterior lip of the cervix or in the posterior lip of the cervix or very rarely it can be central when it grows around the cervical canal. International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics (FIGO) has proposed a new classification of fibroids that categorizes submucous, intramural, subserosal, and transmural fibroids. Type 0 is an intracavity fibroid that is a pedunculated submucosal fibroid entirely within the uterine cavity. When less than 50% of the submucous fibroid diameter is lying within the myometrium, it is called a type 1 fibroid. When 50% or more of the submucous fibroid diameter lies within the myometrium, it is called a type 2 fibroid. Submucous fibroid that abets the endometrium without any intracavity component is called as type 3 fibroid. Type 4 fibroid is an intramural fibroid that is lying entirely within the myometrium without extension to either the endometrial surface or to the serosa. A subserous fibroid that is at least 50% intramural is called as type 5 fibroid. 
whereas a subserosal fibroid whose less than 50% of the portion is intramural is called as type 6 fibroid. A subserosal fibroid attached to the serosa by a stalk or a pedicle is called as type 7 fibroid. A fibroid which has no involvement of the myometrium is called as type 8 fibroid. This includes cervical fibroid, those in the round or broad ligament with direct attachment to the uterus and parasitic fibroid. Transdural fibroid is a new category in which the fibroid has relationship to both the endometrial and the serosal surfaces with the endometrial relationship noted first, for example type 2-5. It is also referred to as hybrid fibroid because it impacts both the endometrium and serosa. Excluding pregnancy, fibroids are the commonest of all pelvic tumors. Fibroids are seen in 20 to 25 percent of all women. 10 to 15 percent of all OPD patients are found to have fibroids. Among African American women, by the age of 35, the incidence of fibroids is 60 percent and it is over 80% by the age of 50. Now I will discuss the etiopathogenesis of fibroids in considerable detail. Each fibroid arises from a single progenitor myocyte which exists from birth. Multiple fibroids within the same uterus each can show independent cytogenetic origins. The recent evidence suggests that there is a strong inherited component of fibroid development. Researchers at the Center for Uterine Fibroids have identified mutations in two genes, HMGIC and HMGIY, that appear to be important in the development of some fibroids. Stereotypic defects involving chromosomes 6, 7, 12, and 14 have been identified in about 40% of fibroid in some studies. It has been suggested that these mutations correlate with the rate and direction of tumor growth. The primary mutation initiating tumorogenesis is not known. It is to be hoped that future research in cytogenetics will lead to new insights in the management of fibroids. Now let us consider the various risk factors for fibroids. Fibroids are rare before 20 and most commonly found in the middle or late reproductive years, usually after 35 years. During the reproductive years, the incidence of fibroids increases with age. They start as seedlings around 16 to 20 years of age, but symptoms take 10 to 12 years to manifest. They are common in nulliparous or oligoparous and relatively infertile women. Probably there is a vicious cycle. Infertility leads to fibroids and fibroids lead to infertility. Race and genetics are important risk factors. African American ethnicity is associated with 3 to 9 times increased risk of developing fibroids compared with Caucasian. Asian or Hispanic women. They also develop the tumors at a younger age and the fibroids grow to large sizes. This is mainly because of their genetic differences that are responsible for enhanced estrogen production or decreased estrogen metabolism. Hereditary is also an important risk factor. Fibroids are known to run in families. Women with affected first degree relatives have two to three times greater risk of developing fibroids. A clinical pearl. Genetic predisposition plays a very important role in fibroid development. It is very well established that fibroids are estrogen and progesterone sensitive tumors. There is abundant evidence to suggest that estrogens promote fibroid growth. This is supported by the clinical observation that fibroids develop during the reproductive years and shrink in size and sometimes disappear after menopause. 
sex steroid hormones likely mediate their effect by stimulating or inhibiting transcription and production of cellular growth factors. Fibroids have higher estrogen concentrations, bind more estrogen and have more estrogen receptors and convert estradiol to estrone more slowly than normal myometry. The role of progesterone in fibroid growth is less clear and indeed both stimulatory and inhibitory effects have been reported. Another clinical pearl, fibroids are estrogen dependent tumors. Although the existing fibroids increase in size and vascularity during pregnancy as a result of elevated levels of estrogen and progesterone, pregnancy by itself is associated with decreased risk of developing fibroids. Pregnancy is a progesterone dominant state and thus provides an interlude from chronic estrogen exposure. This and uterine remodeling during postpartum involution is postulated to be responsible for decreased risk. Women giving birth at an early age and those with high parity and those with more recent pregnancy all display lower incidences of fibroid formation. Early menarche is associated with increased risk owing to greater years of estrogen exposure. Postmenopausal state is associated with decreased risk because of hypoestrogenism. Obesity is associated with increased risk because of greater adipose conversion of androgens to estrogens and decreased hepatic production of sex hormone binding globulin. Cigarette smoking is associated with decreased risk because of lower physiologically active serum estrogen levels and altered estrogen metabolism. Prolonged use of combined oral contraceptive pills is associated with decreased risk because exposure to estrogen is opposed by progesterone. Some studies, however, have shown no effect of combined oral contraceptive pills on this risk. More recently, growth factors have been shown to mediate the growth promoting effects of estrogen and to play an important role in the development of fibroids. Potentially important factors in fibroid growth include transforming growth factors beta, basic fibroblast growth factor, epidermal growth factor, insulin-like growth factor, and platelet-derived growth factor. A diet rich in beef, other red meat, and ham increase the incidence of fibroids, while a diet rich in green vegetables decrease this risk. These findings are difficult to interpret because calorie and fat intake were not measured. Exercise may also play a role. Women in the highest category of physical activity, that is approximately 7 hours per week, were significantly less likely to have fibroids than women in the lowest category, that is less than 2 hours per week. What about postmenopausal hormone therapy? For the majority of postmenopausal women with fibroids, hormone therapy will not stimulate fibroid growth. If fibroids do grow, progesterone is likely to be the cause. Overall, estrogen, progesterone, and growth factors likely promote tumor growth, but only after the initiation of tumor formation as a result of genetic mutation. There are a number of conditions associated with increased estrogen production that encourage fibroid formation. Conditions associated with fibroids are follicular cysts of ovary, endometrial hyperplasia, endometrial carcinoma, endometriosis, and adenomyosis. Now I will discuss the pathology of fibroids. Fibroids grow as a single tumor or in clusters. They are spherical or lobulated. 
They can vary in size from a pea to a melon. They produce a nodular that is bosonated or smooth enlargement of the uterus. The consistency is hard to firm or soft if beset with degenerative changes. On cut section, the myometrium shows multiple small or large spherical tumor masses which are well circumscribed and have greyish or pale white color. A pseudo capsule comprising compressed myometrium encapsulates them. The cut section has a characteristic bold or onion peel appearance because of bundles of muscles and fibrous tissue interlacing with each other. In areas of degeneration, the tumor masses may have a homogeneous appearance and the bold appearance may be lost. Microscopic appearance shows interlacing bundles of muscle tissue and fibrous tissue, especially in older and larger tumors, encapsulated by compressed normal myometry. Blood vessels may be seen at the periphery of the tumor. Fibroids can undergo a variety of degenerative changes like cystic degeneration, hyaline degeneration, fatty degeneration, mucoid degeneration, calcification, and very rarely ossification. Sometimes fibroids undergo circulatory changes like red degeneration, also known as necrobiosis, which is common during pregnancy, hypertrophy, atrophy, telangiectasis, and lymphangiectasis. Sarcomatous degeneration is a very rare occurrence seen in 1 in 1000 to 8 in 1000 uterine fibroids. About two-thirds of the uterine sarcomas arise in fibroids. Fibroids can undergo various complications like torsion of pedicle, hemorrhage from rupture of capsular vein, impaction, degenerative or malignant change, infection in a submucous myoma. A mobile pedunculated subserous fibroid mechanically irritates the peritoneum leading to ascites. This is known as pseudomakes syndrome. A submucous pedunculated fibroid can pull on the fundus and give rise to chronic uterine inversion. This is the end of part 1 of my e-lecture on uterine fibroids. In the second part, I will discuss the clinical features, diagnosis and management of fibroids. For further reading on this topic and other topics in obstetrics and gynecology, refer to following books written by me. Practical Obstetrics and Gynecology Modern Obstetrics Modern Gynecology Clinical Cases in Obstetrics, Questions and Answers Clinical Cases in Gynecology, Questions and Answers and Pelvic Reconstructive Surgery If you have found this video useful and informative, please subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking here.